Hi, I'm Ian Vasquez, Vice President for International Studies at the Cato Institute. It's been nearly a year since Beijing uh, passed its national security law that allowed it to crack down on Hong Kong and advocates of democracy there and critics of uh, the regime of the government in Hong Kong and of, of Beijing uh, and accuse, it of, uh, accuse such critics of attempts at terrorism separation or subversion. In doing so, China broke its promise to keep Hong Kong autonomous for 50 years and started what has been an astounding and rapid assault on Hong Kong's freedoms. Um, in Hong Kong, we have seen uh, dozens and actually hundreds of protesters and activists and journalists been, who have been jailed uh, including dozens of pro-democracy uh, politicians. Schools and bookstores have censored themselves. Dissidents have fled. Uh, most prominently, we've seen uh, pro-democracy uh, publisher Jimmy Lai, the publisher of Apple Daily, convicted and jailed uh, in recent days and weeks in Hong Kong. And in more recent days, uh, the authorities have uh, gotten a hold, of frozen the assets of Apple Daily, Jimmy Lai's newspaper, the most critical pro-democracy uh, newspaper in Hong Kong, and arrested its editors and other journalists there to the point that the paper uh, has now had to close. This assault on uh, press freedom uh, was building up, but has been uh, an unprecedented uh, assault in, in Hong Kong. And for those of us who care about the freedom of Hong Kong in, and certainly in a place that used to symbolize and well represent one of the freest places on the planet. This loss of freedom has been alarming. I'm joined today uh, by uh, two uh, friends and colleagues from Hong Kong uh, who will discuss the situation there. Uh, the first who will uh, say a few words in, in this discussion is Alex Chow, one of the leaders of the pro-democracy umbrella movement in, in Hong Kong, also one of the organizers of the 2014 Occupy Central uh, uh, protests uh, that led to his, uh, his uh, jailing and, and actually his imprisonment. He is now uh, living in the United States like many um, pro-democracy act activists, he has had to leave uh, Hong Kong. We're also joined by Samuel Chow, the managing director of the Hong Kong Democracy Council, and he'll speak a bit about uh, what they're doing uh, and what their mission is. And also by Doug Bandau, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Um, let us begin by hearing from Alex about the situation in Hong Kong, where things stand, and how you view um, the prospects uh, for Hong Kong and its liberties. Sure. Uh, thanks, Ian, uh, for organizing this panel. Uh, so I'll just give an overview about like what's happening in Hong Kong, and probably like Samuel could talk a bit about our effort, like in the states and elsewhere. Um, so the big picture is that the Chinese Communist Party is destroying all the democratic institutions in the city and turn Hong Kong into another Chinese city governed by the pro-CCP nationalist doctrine. So the story starts in uh, 2019, where the Hong Kong protesters gained momentum and support over the public and a local council election. So folks gained a landslide victory in the only democratic election in the city. And by 2020, the opposition camp planned to capture the majority of the legislature so in response to this tactic, uh, Beijing circumvented the local legal procedures uh, by passing the local legislature and imposed uh, national security law to Hong Kong, a draconian law that gives the government immense power to destroy the democratic institution in town and lock up activists. So the law criminalized subversion, uh, secession, collusion with foreign forces and terrorist acts, which were broadly defined to include disruption to public transport and other infrastructure. So this move uh, gave uh, police sweeping powers to arrest uh, protesters 
uh, freeze the banking account of independent media and threaten to dismantle civil organization in Hong Kong. So just today, Hong Kong's Secretary for, Sec uh, for Security, John Lee, who was a former police officer, is to step up as the city's chief secretary, the government's number two official. And the current commissioner of police, uh, Chris Tan, who's in charge of the operation during the 2019 anti-extradition movement. We also had the secretary bureau, which is responsible uh, for the national security law uh, uh, operation. So the legislative council election, uh, election like was postponed and pro-democracy leaders are either in jail or in exile. Uh, like Joshua Wong, Anna Chow, or Jamie Lai were some prominent leaders, among others, who were thrown into jail, like, well, after the passing of the national security law. And many of them, like, uh, declined the bail, uh, which violates common law practice. So the government also passed a law um, earlier this year, like, well, hugely shrinking the directly elected seats in the Legislative Council, gaining, uh, like, a tighter control over the institution. And you could also see, like, well, uh, the government is attacking uh, the press freedom, speech freedom, and other freedom that have been enjoyed by Hong Kong people uh, over the past like three decades or so. And one example is like an award-winning journalist, Bao Choi, is prosecuted for her team producing a documentary that challenges whether the government has colluded uh, with the triad to attack the protesters during the 2019 movement. And as you mentioned, like, well, uh, the government has also like uh, recently uh, frozen the banking account of Apple Daily, arrested its editor in chief and forced it into closure uh, just this week. So folks expect like more to come in the next few weeks or, or months. Uh, people are expecting like a uh, more than hundred democratically elected district uh, councillors will be disqualified. Uh, and as we may all know, like the well-known June 4th Virgil has been forced to cancel because the police refused to give permit uh, to the organizers. And whether like, well, uh, in like 1st July, whether the 1st July March, an annual protest held in the city since 2003, will be allowed it is pretty much in doubt. Uh, folks expect that like the police and the government will also ban the march uh, and forbid like well, protesters like well, uh, gathering and congregating on the streets. Um, so folks are also expecting like well, other independent media will be shut down soon. Uh, so like at this point, at this critical juncture, like many pro-democracy citizens have either fled or considered leaving the city. Uh, Canada, Britain, and Taiwan are some countries that have taken in a number of protesters as refugees who fear unreasonable prosecution and long time jailing. So uh, we could conclude that like we are facing an uphill battle, but many remain committed to protect and preserve the idea of Hong Kong, Hong Kongers and the city itself. Uh, like many protesters, uh, pro-democracy like citizens, uh, they are still staying in the city. Uh, like while well, trying to use like the creativity like to resist like well uh, like the oppression and the attack of the government of their freedom uh, but like folks elsewhere like well Samuel and Hong Kong Democ uh, Democracy Council we are also trying to like well uh, like um, like continue our advocacy work uh, to provide support to Hong Kong's democracy movement so that might be the situation it's, so it is like really a dynamic situation that like folks are moving around and uh, many things might be happening and will be happening and so like, well, we are um, like in a midway of a long fight. Thanks very much. Um, now let, let's hear from Samuel Chu. I may have mispronounced his name earlier. So I, I apologize about your efforts uh, in promoting uh, democracy at the Hong Kong Democracy Council. Thank you, Ian. And thank you, Doug. And, and also thank you, Alex, who uh, is uh, also a member of our advisory board at Hong Kong Democracy Council. Uh, my name is Samuel Chu, as Ian said. Uh, when we founded Hong Kong Democracy Council in Washington, D.C. two years ago, I think in the back of our mind, we had anticipated that at some point during this movement, that folks in Hong Kong would not be able to freely speak out or travel overseas to make the case for democracy and human rights in Hong Kong. I think that many of us did not expect that it would happen in under two years. Um, just uh, at our launch uh, press conference, uh, Joshua Wong um, and Denise Ho and others were actually with us on the, uh, just steps away from Capitol Hill, having just testified at a hearing of the Congressional Executive uh, China Commission. Um, and even then, I think that we 
uh, wanted to make sure that there was a, a presence, a permanent long-term operation in the U.S. and in Washington, D.C., who can be the voice by Hong Konger for Hong Kongers uh, for the movement. But fast forward now, uh, just about 22 months since we started, uh, none of those activists uh, who stood with us uh, can speak out anymore because many of them are in jail. None of them can travel outside of Hong Kong because they have been restricted. Even if they're not in jail, they have been uh, asked and restricted in speaking to foreign media or any official uh, or even just people like us at HKDC were just communication with us is deemed as a basis for prosecutions. And so I wanna uh, touch on a couple of points that I think Alex already uh, spoke on, is that I, I think it's clear that it's not just that the fight is happening in Hong Kong, that this repression is happening overseas, thousands of miles away. This actually has come, and, and for a while now, come to the soil, on, on, on American soil. Um, after the implementation of the national security law where it has been used to suppress, there's been now a total of 128 arrests and prosecutions under the national security law in Hong Kong. But that is not the extent of its reach. Just a month after the implementations, I became the first U.S. citizen to be issued arrest warrant by the Hong Kong authorities under national security law for essentially lobbying and petitioning my own US government as a US citizen. That is how far reaching the tactics and the strategies of what the CCP and the Hong Kong government is deploying. Just this week, we watch as an, another American citizen, Samuel Bickett, uh, has been convicted of assaulting a police officers under very dubious circumstances and witness and evidence he has now been convicted for essentially being a good Samaritan in Hong Kong, helping a passerby who was being beaten up by a plain clothes off-duty police officers. This kind of taking over of the judicial system and the government and the streets of Hong Kong by security forces has really forced uh, us to confront uh, the, the, the kind of repression that is not just happening in the mainland, not just happening in Hong Kong, but now coming to the doorstep of American soils. Another thing that I think um, that we are, we've been working on, as, as Alex mentioned, is that many Hong Kongers who are facing protest related charges and NSL charges are now seeking safe refuge. Uh, I have a unique personal connection to this. My father uh, was one of the organizer of the uh, operation that smuggled dissident who escaped from Tiananmen Square back in 89. Back then, Hong Kong was used as a safe harbor to rescue a generation of activists who escaped the massacre in June 4th. And now Hong Kongers are actually looking for a safe harbor. Just this uh, January uh, this year, H Hong Kong Democracy Council took in five protesters who fled Hong Kong by boat to Taiwan because they were facing long, unfair trial and jail sentences for participating in the protests. We were able to arrange for humanitarian parole visa for them to come to the US and we settled here. But thousands of others face the same fate if they remain in Hong Kong. That's why HKDC has been set up in the US to not only continue to pursue US policies to pressure China in rolling back and restoring Hong Kong's autonomy through things like economic sanctions, visa bans of officials who are responsible for those repression, but also to build up the overseas diaspora of Hong Kong where we can help to rescue protesters and pro-democracy leaders, resettle them in overseas uh, countries, but continue to cultivate and invest in the movement overseas. And then finally, uh, we also want to continue uh, to give Americans a clear and uh, accurate updated look at what is happening on the ground. That if multinational uh, media company, corporation, financial companies could be taken down 
by the Hong Kong government under the national security law. That can happen to anybody. If a foreign um, expat in Hong Kong who was a lawyer for the Bank of America uh, could be charged and convicted with very little evidence and be sentenced to jail in Hong Kong, it could happen to any of us. If someone like me who has been a US citizen for 25 years, speaking out for Hong Kong and against the CCP in the US could be pursued with arrest warrants and, and, and not be able to safely travel back to Hong Kong, it could happen to any Americans. And so I think that those are some of the realities that we're confronting and some of the work that we're now doing in the US to be able to not just continue the movement for Hong Kong, but to really uh, put it uh, squarely in the broader context of America's uh, interests globally as we look at uh, what is happening and unfolding on the ground. Thanks very much, uh, Samuel. Doug Bandau has been following uh, Hong Kong for decades and he's been writing frequently about Hong Kong uh, in recent months and, and certainly over the past uh, year or more. Uh, Doug? Well, thanks, Ian. And you know, it's a great pleasure to be on with Samuel and Alex. You know, we here at Cato do work on liberty, but we're lucky enough to live in a country where that liberty is protected, despite all the problems the U.S. has, that we can criticize our government and be activists without the fear. And, you know, so I, I have great, you know, great, uh, you know, kind of I think what you all do is extraordinarily important. And I think that, you know, you deserve great praise for that because the activism that you all do is serious, that uh, you could land you in jail if you would go back uh, to a place like Hong Kong. And is the kind of thing that at the moment is landing a lot of people in Hong Kong in jail, you know, not just under the national security law, but after its passage, uh, you know, the government went after a lot of people for protests a year or more before which they had not gone after for all that time. And originally, Jimmy Lai was charged under that. And then the national security law charges came later. You know, and I think that in many ways, it's important for people in America to look at this law and what has happened and realize this is a way uh, the, the Chinese have proved they understand how to, how to tyrannize people. I mean, that they, they were very, very effective. I did not imagine it, it would happen so quickly. That uh, I mean, in the Apple Daily closure, I think in many ways is an important coda where it was the most vocal, the most important pro-democracy, uh, at least journalistic force, I think, in the city. And it's had to close. And we're at, uh, roughly a year, almost exactly a year after the passage of that law. When it was first uh, imposed, Kerry Lam, the uh, chief executive for Hong Kong, said, oh, it'd be used very sparingly, that it, uh, it would be kind of a light touch. And there were people at the time who, who were more honest. Uh, you know, some of the uh, Hong Kong members of the National People's Assembly uh, the local uh, you know, Beijing representatives, uh, you know, kind of the local Gao lighters, I suppose you could call them, you know, were saying, oh, you know, we want this to be ambiguous. We want people not to be certain how it's going to be imposed because they wanted to shut down activity. They wanted people to be scared. You know, they didn't necessarily, I think, want everybody in jail, but they wanted everybody to realize they could go to jail because that would serve their purpose very well. And what we've seen is then how it's been used exactly that way, which is to shut down all the normal democratic processes that, uh, and I mean, this, and this has been going on for a time. I mean, go back to the umbrella protests that Alex was involved in the, and we saw some steady activity of, you know, people running for the legislative uh, you know, council who were being disqualified, you know, the oaths of office, the issue of whether they were pro-independence, you know, we had the kidnappings of publishers. I mean, there's, this was building in the you know, kind of 2014 you know, or so on, you know, in, in various steps. So we could see this happening. Nevertheless, the ability of people in Hong Kong to protest clearly was a major impediment to the, uh, the local government. And that is uh, obviously what the Beijing decided it had a break and, and it certainly used this law. And I think it's just useful to realize how broad its application is. You know, there are no definitions here in terms of what is a violation of national security. Well, it's splitism, it's separatism. It's, I mean, it's, you know, basically it's working with foreigners against the interest of, uh, you know, Hong Kong. It's, you know, there are these things that can be applied almost to anyone. And we've seen it applied to the media, you know, that Apple Daily is merely the most visible. It is not the only, you know, journalistic, uh, you know, source or the, their writers are not the only ones who've been prosecuted. We look at education. 
essentially putting the fear into everyone from uh, you know, elementary school teachers, to university professors in terms of teaching the truth about whether it be Tiananmen Square, liberty, you know, what's gone in China, history. It's um, protests that have effectively been shut down. And as I mentioned, again, retroactively going after people, making it very clear, you, know, you, may, be, you may have been one of 500,000 people in an illegal protest and they're gonna come after you because you're a leader, because you're high profile that uh, you know, they will shut that down. The elections, quite extraordinary. I think Alex mentioned those district elections where traditionally the Democratic activists had not run very heavily in them and it was a complete wipeout. And what we've seen since then, of course, is postponing the Legislative Council elections and then a number of steps in terms of throwing people out of the Ledge Co, you know, preventing people from running in the future, New uh, conditions have been set in terms of who's eligible. You have to now be seen as patriotic, meaning a patriotic towards the uh, Chinese Communist Party, towards the mainland. You know, so this kind of limited democratic system itself is being almost completely shut down. Uh, we've seen with bookstores and libraries, fear of actually you know, having any of these that could be critical. Again, speaking the truth about uh, China and its history. You know, the uh, questions of interviewing critics as a journalist, you know, being critical oneself, advocating ideas that are considered, uh, you know, inappropriate, uh, you know, symbolic speech, signs. I mean, we've seen this very, very broad interpretation and use here. And I think, I think it was Alex who said that essentially, you know, Hong Kong is, the, the political rules now are essentially, this is any other Chinese city, that uh, you have no more freedom really to criticize you know, Beijing criticized the Communist Party today in Hong Kong than you would have in Beijing or any number of other cities, you know, in the mainland. And of course, this is occurring when if you can look at popular attitudes, there's un understandably been a shift of attitudes, you know, that young people especially were already moving away from calling themselves Chinese, but this has clearly had a, a seismic impact on attitudes of the population, but of course there's very little they can do. We've seen that as well with Taiwan. And I think the, you know, again, it's useful for Americans and others in other uh, Europe and other places of freedom to recognize this could become a template for other you know, regimes in other countries in terms of how do they impose themselves relatively effectively and relatively swiftly in ways that I think most of us underestimated. Uh, and I think the, the question of what to do, and I, you know, I certainly hope people who watch this you know, podcast will take concern in this. And the fact there are organizers and people out there like you know, Samuel and Alex is very important. There are groups in, in Europe and elsewhere that to keep the flame of liberty alive in Hong Kong is very important for all of us. Thank you, Doug. Uh, and, and thank you all. The Hong Kong authorities say that the, the national security law is just... Uh, something that all countries have. They have to look after their, their national security and, and there's nothing unusual about it, but we've now heard from the three of you that, that there is uh, uh, something that's quite far reaching about it. But um, can you, uh, Alex or Samuel, give us a little bit more of a discussion about how uh, there really is no due process under this uh, security law, how far reach, how different it is from the tradition uh, that Hong Kong has has had now for for decades, and how it upends uh, really the the entire rule of law in Hong Kong. I understand uh, that the security law uh, allows for people to be tried even in in China, mainland China itself with uh, those uh, judicial authorities, which we know are not uh, independent under uh, some conditions. Uh, and, and you also mentioned sort of the extraterritoriality of the, this law that uh, if you, even being a US citizen or I or any uh, one of us speaking in the United States or anywhere outside of China, say something that they might not like, we could be uh, uh, arrested or held uh, legally uh, accountable if we visited Hong Kong under the security law. Maybe Alex, would you like to uh, begin? I can say a few words and then Samuel might be able to like well tell us like well he himself as a victim or a target of the national security law. Um, so when we talk about the national security law in Hong Kong we usually think that like well Hong Kong is not a democracy it's only like semi-democratic and how could like 
how could like the cities like this could protect citizen from a national security law? That, that's like a big question uh, for many of the folks living there. Like if you say like, well, other countries might also have national security law then folks in Hong Kong will say, hey, they have election, they have democracy, they have separation of power, but all the values and these kind of institution that were once upheld in Hong Kong, they were all gone. So like now the government is asking or requesting for the collaboration of power, like the executive branch, uh, the judiciary, and also um, uh, like, like, like every like, well, uh, 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 administrative units, they should be under the leadership uh, of the Chinese Communist Party. So it is in no way that like, well, the legal system is independent and it could in no way like protect like well, Hong Kongers right. And I think it reflects in the conceptual framework and also the rhetoric used by the government itself. Now it's like we're well, putting uh, like well, uh, national loyalty uh, uh, like over like other values, like, uh, uh, like activists or protesters like couldn't even get, get a bail from the court. I think that is like one prominent example or one obvious changing of how like the legal system in Hong Kong could not really protect citizens. Like, like well, getting a bail is usually seen as like, well, uh, a basic right under the common law practice, but it is now gone. So uh, how, how, how could like, well, uh, the national security law in Hong Kong could be deemed or viewed as like, well, having the same or equal status as like uh, other national security law, like implemented in democracy. So that's like one big question. Uh, folks might engage in such kind of debate. Yeah, and, and I can jump in. I think, um, I mean, your question, I think is, is, is um, if you look carefully, I think Alex already uh, talked about some of the features of the national security law. But I think that the, the, in context, what the NSL was really built to do was to have multiple layer of safeguards so that there will never be any doubt of the uh, charges, the conviction, and the control of the sentencing of every person who is pursued under the NSL. So you have, for example, what Alex already talked about, this uh, revoking of the assumption of bail. So if you look at the NSL charges and the trial proceedings, what they're actually doing is that even if they do in any case right now grant any kind of bail, there are conditions that limit any of the exercising of the political rights and freedom that a person would enjoy. So you could even you know, get bail, but you would have to sit at home and never exercise any of your civic and political rights. There's a layer of the fact that the NSL allows the Hong Kong administration and government to handpick judges on who would hear those cases. And we just saw this past week that the first case that is going to trial the petitioner, the defendant, had actually petitioned the court for a jury trial. And the court came back and said that under the NSL, you're not given the option or the right for a jury trial. Only the handpicked judges would actually be allowed to hear these cases. And then, yeah, and I think you mentioned this, is that there's another layer. As if, if that's not enough protection for their control, you could, and we very much expect that at some point soon, someone like Jimmy Lai could be extradited and sent to the mainland because their charges under the NSL is considered complicated or including foreign forces. And so there are these safeguards that the CCP and the Beijing government has built in to ensure that at every level, even if you're able to, let's say, get out of the first layer, you would then be captured at the next level so that you will never be able to extricate yourself from the web of the NSL. The other thing I think we already touched on about the extraterritorial nature of pursuing foreign citizen, American citizen like me, but I think that Doug talked on a point that was really important at the beginning, which is that this creates a massive gray area, right? Of the idea that, um, some of the cases and arrests that was made early on was about displaying slogan and uh, 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 model that we were chanting in, in the protest. So does that mean that any use of the words or the phrases that are associated with protests now becomes outlaw and banned? 
reporters watching the closing and shuttering of Apple Daily now thinks about, can I write this in a news report? Or am I going to be then subject to arrest and my news outlet be shut down? What you're seeing is this infinite web of um, people who are connected to Alex or to me, Americans, company, individuals, who are asking themselves, can I be associated even just on a very superficial social media basis? If we post at something that Alex is writing on social media, does that put me into the position of being blacklisted and being targeted? That enormous gray area is precisely, I think, what the NSL is designed to do beyond just the primitive draconian prosecution and jailing that we're seeing. I assume that um, this uh, will lead to a whole lot of self-censorship and maybe not just among pro-democracy advocates or activists, but uh, among the wider Hong Kong community, which may even include the business community. After all, in a, in a free society, you as a business leader or a member of a business association uh, typically feel free to criticize the latest government policy that, that affects business. Um, to what extent are you seeing uh, the business community uh, c censoring itself or uh, reacting to uh, these um, anti-democracy, uh, anti-pro-democracy activists, um, and for that matter, to to expand on on the question, to what extent is the security law, because of its extraterritoriality, uh, uh, producing self censorship outside of of China? Well, I, I could jump in and maybe start yeah. and, and then Alex and Doug can, can jump in as well. I, I think that, I mean, I think there was a, a very crystallizing moment a couple of years ago when, um, in 2019 when Daryl Morey, who was then general manager at the Houston Rockets, uh, uh, happened to retweet or like a tweet on, uh, on online about Hong Kong. And as uh, we say, um, that literally one tweet shut down the NBA in mainland China. I mean, they took it off the air, literally. And, and I think that back then we were thinking, oh, you know, this is such a like a, a shocking, I mean, it's coming to the U.S. and censorship of a U.S. owned company, of a U.S. executive, of a U.S. company. Uh, little did we know that that was really just the beginning, because now what we're seeing is that um, if you want to do business in Hong Kong, so for example, in the Apple Daily case, uh, it wasn't just that they were arresting the editorial staff. It was because they were able to freeze the bank accounts and convince all the banks to stop doing business with Apple Daily overnight. And, and that kind of complicity, I think, is very much uh, where we are at today. And I think you see not just uh, the level of um, complicity in terms of uh, people not speaking out, you are seeing financial institutions and other corporations actively supporting. We see this in the push for, uh, you know, we are supportive of our brothers and sisters and colleagues in the Uyghur uh, human rights community about forced labor. But just as there are voices now, you know, in the last year, raising the issues of forced labor and internment camp of Uyghurs, there's a whole operation of the CCP able to leverage companies to come out and say that, well, we love our Shenzhen cotton. We actually you know, uh, are proud of producing forced labor uh, you know, uh, products because that's the kind of, I think, reach and leverage that the, the, the Beijing regime has. And I think that this uh, has to be called out. And I think this is why it's so important that Americans particularly understand that this is at their doorstep. This is happening on the television screens. Uh, we are going to be hosting the 2022 Olympics game in a country that is what by all definition, Americans administration have said, con committing acts of genocide. But they're able to do it because they're able to force people into self-censorship, but also 
explicit, you know, support of what the regime is actually doing. Doug, what, in your view, can the United States uh, do uh, about this crackdown on, on freedoms in Hong Kong, if anything? Well, it's quite challenging. Um, you know, the ability to try to reach into Hong Kong and the problem is to affect PRC policy. I mean, you know, for the PRC, it's, you know, it's interesting trying to figure out exactly what caused Xi Jinping to move but obviously he's been cracking down across, I mean, Chinese society, of course. I mean, we see you know, widespread religious repression that's gotten much worse, <laughs> restrictions on academic exchanges. We saw the shutdown of uh, UniRule, <laughs> which was a, an NGO that Cato worked with, which you know, sought economic reform. They were always very careful. They did not push radical political stances. And they're not the only NGO that have been shut down. We've seen a lot of pressure put on schools for patriotic education. Uh, you know, they've essentially destroyed the human rights bar. Uh, there were human rights lawyers who would get involved about five years ago. The hundreds of them were arrested, disbarred. In fact, two of them came forward to handle the case of the uh, like dozen people who tried to escape. You know, they, they, they took a boat to, to escape. Hong Kong got picked up by the Chinese Coast Guard. And of course, were taken to Beijing for trial. Two lawyers, human rights lawyers, came forward to try to take their cases. Beijing not only refused to let them take the case, they disbarred them because, of course, this was inappropriate behavior and they were you know, saying terrible, slanderous things about the People's Republic. You know, so what we're seeing, I think, in Hong Kong is part of a much larger piece. I mean, there are some, I think, pieces we, I mean, in terms of censorship external, I think that you know, what Samuel's pointed to is, I mean, the good news is, for the most part, they do that through economic pressure, not by throwing people in jail. Technically, and I asked one of the Hong Kong representatives this, given what I have written on Hong Kong, could I be charged under the law? And they, they gave kind of a nervous laugh and thought, well, you know, I mean, lots of people are saying that sort of thing. I don't think so. But by the terms of the law, of course, I could. Now, I don't think that China will do that because they understand that that you know, would be uh, would create huge repercussions. But it's certainly worthwhile for the U.S. government to make very clear to China that it had better not, you know, kind of go after Americans who are critical. Just make that, you know, we don't want intrusion in our system. I, I think one issue is how do you help companies in certain ways be better citizens? It's not just the NBA. I mean, it's United Airlines and others were told that they couldn't list Taiwan as a separate country. I mean, we've seen a lot of this. And I think that's an area that the U.S. potentially could work with friendly countries, that is the Europeans, Australia, Japan, in essence, to have a common position. And there may also be an issue, for example, of making sure that our legislation doesn't hamper companies from working together. If China knows it's dealing with all international airlines and not just one, you know, that's something where I think we need to, how do we, I mean, we have much greater leverage outside because the, most of the economy is not China. It's a big economy, but you put the US, Europeans, Japan together, you know, that, that's something China would have to deal with. You know, the question of you know, trying to change the national security law to try to bring back some of the freedoms, I think, is much harder. We've put uh, individual sanctions on. Carrie Lam is one. And I'm, you know, I, there, there was a wonderful Wall Street Journal article about, I think it was Wall Street Journal, about how she had no bank that she could use. Because um, the, our restrictions are that if you, if you have dealings with American banks, you can't deal with it. So she had all of her money was piled all over her apartment you know, when they were meeting. And she was complaining about this. And I have to say, I thought that was just nice. That uh, you know, it's not nearly enough retribution for the harm she has caused. But it's certainly a bit of satisfaction to see that. But of course, that doesn't change the Chinese policy. And I, you know, the question then is how to, you know, what I think the most important thing the U.S. and other countries can do is to give refuge to people fleeing. I mean, that's that's the starting point. If people get out, I mean, the, the, the folks who got to Taiwan and then got parole, very, very important that we do that. You know, Great Britain has offered to do that. China, and that doesn't want to, you know, accept their passports. I mean, there's a lot going on here. But I, to me, that's the first step. The Beyond that, sanctions on Hong Kong, of course, we hurt Hong Kongers. I mean, what we want to do is find mechanisms that punish you know, those who are the, 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 you know, the people who are doing this, is the persecutors, essentially, as opposed to Hong Kongers. So the question is, are there particular economic steps that we can take? You know, the tr Trump administration did what I think was required, which is to say we won't treat Hong Kong as separate now. 
kind of in a, a juridical sense from mainland because our view is these policies are effectively being set in Beijing. So that eliminated some of the, the uh, trade preferences that Hong Kong got. And the, the problem with that is it probably hurts Hong Kongers more, but at least it has some, it is, it's an acknowledgement that China has essentially gone back on its word, that the, the, the turnover agreement, the 50 years has been thrown out the window, that they've essentially taken direct control. You know, the difficulty is that, you know, if you're thinking human rights of the PRC generally, we, you know, what can we do on the Uyghurs? What can we do? You, know, you go down this list, there is a long list there. So certainly the, you know, the starting point is to try to get together with other democratic countries and have a united position. It strikes me criticism is worth worthwhile to try to use that. And then again, you know, targeting you know, particular people, agencies, uh, you know, going, you know, setting rules for American companies. An American company should not be involved in slave labor. Uh, American companies shouldn't sell surveillance equipment. I mean, there, there are certain things that I think we can say about who we deal with in China that uh, I think overall that, that engagement remains in, in a sense of necessity, but we certainly want to say there are certain forms that are not free, that we, we don't want our institutions, we don't want our companies, our people involved in ways that are directly underwriting, directly supporting uh, tyrannical practices. Uh, and I think the long-term, and this is one where I think you know, perhaps you know, Samuel and Alex you know, can play a role and others might have ideas, is how do we kind of keep the information flow into the PRC open? That is to try to have, make sure that people there learn as much as possible <laughs> about what Hong Kong was and what's happened there. The reality of Tiananmen Square, I just finished the book June 4th. I mean, a very, very powerful, relatively short, but very powerful you know, discussion of, of what happened at Tiananmen Square and how close in certain ways it came to success, you know, very tragically. That lesson needs to be taught to Chinese people. They need to understand that history, which is not taught. You know, they need to understand kind of currents within ancient Chinese thought that actually promote liberty. We've had somebody at Cato, Jim Dorn, who's worked on that in terms of understanding that there are, freedom is not a Western imposition on China. These, these freedom ideas are deeply embedded within Chinese culture. So I think the question then is how do we make sure those, to me, that's the long-term. So I have hope over the long-term that Xi Jinping will be temporary. I mean, Mao Zedong died, Deng Xiaoping opened up economically, did not go politically. You know, Xi Jinping leaves the scene. I have hope that there will be a backlash, that there will be people who come forward and want freedom. Then I think then how do we help Chinese prepare for that? How do we, you know, in terms of the information, how do we help people outside in exile who could be prepared to go back in? These are, I would think long-term, let's play a long game here. Samuel or Alex, do you want to talk about... Uh what you view would be constructive policies from the West? Yeah, I could go first. Um, I think Doc is absolutely right that we, we are in the long game. And uh, one question like stemming from the question of the long game is like, what kind of like new China policy do we have like moving forward? I think that is like a critical piece in restructuring like our policy towards Hong Kong, even China. Uh, because like in, in the past three decades, we could see that like the engagement policy like does not really serve the purpose in transforming China economically and politically. Like we once hoped that like, well, uh, by like, well, taking China into the WTO might really open up the market like for like Western companies and really like, well, transform China economically. And hence like it might liberalize its political system. But like, well, uh, after 2008 or especially in recent years, we could see like, well, China is taking its own path. Like it's saying like, well, we now have the Chinese model and we no longer have to follow the European or American model, like politically or economically speaking. So what's next uh, is like human rights, democracy and liberty, still some of the universal values that we uphold uh, and some values that we would like to spread like uh, across the globe. That is one question because that might also impact like uh, how the US or European countries in dealing with like China, especially uh, in terms of trade. Uh, and uh, technological policy. I think that is one key pieces that we might have to consider because like without like while we're thinking our economic partnership with China, then like, well, uh, we could really hard, like you could, it is almost impossible to really like, well, uh, like, well, uh, backtrack or roll back uh, the impact of the national security law 
because like the, the legitimacy or the foundation of the Chinese government is, is economic power and its economic stability. And its economic stability really relies on the partnership and collaboration of like, well, Western enterprises and Western countries. And if we do not change that like direction and rethinking, what my other provisions say like human rights, uh, when we talk about or negotiate with China in terms of like economic or trade uh, policy, then there's no way that we could really like, well, um, like liberalize China or liberalize Hong Kong politically. So I think that might be like a key reflection that we have. I think this kind of conversation should be happening. And without this conversation, uh, we could really hard to imagine an alternative that might be coming because like the, 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 the only like scenario that might be coming to us is like, well, China, like at some point might take over like well, U.S. like well in the global arena, just because like well we are not equipped uh, um, like enough uh, so as to like well tackle this challenge because like I think the Chinese leaders uh, they are savvy in a way that they are learning the the tricks like how to play the games in the international arena and and how to like well trap others uh, by like using as economic leverage. I think that those are some like well uh, key encounters that we have to reflect on, and only by reflecting on them could we like well reflect on like well. Hey, then, like, well, what have you done? What have we done wrong in the past three decades or so, and how we could be more strategically savvy, like, moving forward, so we could, like, well, put politics and economy together in, like, creating more leverage over uh, the long game. Those are all tricky issues, Samuel. Do you want to add uh, to that? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to, say, uh, yeah, I think a couple points. I think I want to acknowledge. I think this particular kind of conversation is important precisely because Hong Kongers needs to be at the center and at the table. Uh, I often, I think, think about the response of Western U.S. Uh, policies and, and reactions often happens just purely sort of from a theoretical perspective. Um, and, and, and I think we started HKDC two years ago because precisely of the fact that we didn't want to repeat of the joint declaration negotiation where it's two parties negotiating on behalf and Hong Kongers being essentially cut out from the process and um, didn't have a seat at the table. And I think that what we're doing, and I applaud Cato for, for doing this, is, is incorporating really uh, Hong Kongers are the people that Beijing's are scared of the most. Because it is the reason why they're cracking down so swiftly is because they cannot afford to lose control and have dissent among its own people because it models for the rest of mainland uh, what resistance and dissent could look like and could continue to, to brew uh, in, in an environment like Hong Kong. And so I think the, the one thing that I think um, the support and, and, and the listening to Hong Kongers like you know, Alex and others who have come out and now settle in, in, in the US to make that the foundational and the center voice for what U.S. response should be to Hong Kong and to China, I think it's important. And I, I really do agree with this long-term, I think, view that we're taking. I think that's what HKDC is looking to do. We are rescuing and helping folks who are fleeing. But long-term, how do we uh, invest in preserving language, culture, identity, uh, but also continuing to invest in the activists who are staying in Hong Kong, the uh, civic society groups that are still there, the reporters and free press that are still trying to operate, um, professional associations, lawyers, doctors, teachers, uh, other form of organized civic society groups, we might not be able to publicly and openly collaborate, but we continue to maintain those connections and communications as seeds, as pockets of resistance where they can continue to operate and build, I think, uh, the movement from within. And I think that is incredibly important. And then I think finally is that I, I do think that um, sometimes we fall into this simplified view of you know, China, US or China free world, uh, as I think even this conversation illustrates, there are many layers and many nuance. And, and, and I think that we have to kind of stay away from these simplified version of this is just anti-China or this is just about the, the new cold war between US and China. But there are many different levers and pressure points that we should pursue 
Uh, and it's not that simple. And I think that uh, we will continue. And, 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 and I think that we want to work with groups like Cato to be able to zero in on those points that are effective and also collaborate with people and groups and individuals in Hong Kong and in China when it is appropriate and necessary. Uh, and I think that uh, that's what I think we will need for the long term. And, and, and not just try to sort of uh, achieve the, the, the quick overnight magic bullet of, you know, um, you know is it China winning or, or, or US winning? Uh, the tit for tat, I think, isn't uh, going to restore the autonomy and freedom in Hong Kong. And as Alex said, the tit for tat in the short term isn't going to democratize Hong Kong or China uh, anytime soon. I think what you said is t- tremendously important and, and uh and right on, and, and the work that you're doing is just uh, uh, quite key in, in all of that. And I know that you, your group is not the, the only one, there, there are a number of them, and, and uh, that too is in, important. Before uh, we leave, we have, uh, I think we have time for just one, one last question, and that has to do with uh, one of Hong Kong's claims to fame, which is its high level of, of economic freedom. And the question I have is, um, how much longer can we expect its level of economic freedom to be maintained? Uh, after all, we see how the rule of law is being deteriorated, and that is one aspect of economic freedom that's important. You yourself, uh, Samuel, mentioned that if they can do this to Apple Daily, shut it down, freeze its assets, all of it done without due process, by, by the way, any business uh, can, can come under that, that threat. What are your expectations, Alex and Samuel, about the prospects of economic freedom? Because we know that personal and political and civil freedoms are, uh, are going down. What about economic freedom? Can it survive? I can, I can take a step. Um, it seems like it, it is like a really open-ended question. Like, well, uh, the Chinese government is hoping to turn Hong Kong into another Singapore. Like, well, taking away its political freedom while like preserving its economic function uh, for like, well, as a financial center and also for laundry for the Chinese officials. So that was like, well, one like what key concept in mind of the Chinese officials. But whether that will be successful, it, it is a question because like, well, Singapore survives by partnering with other democracy. So like democracy usually considers Singapore as an ally, but like if like, whether democracy would consider Hong Kong as an ally when the national security law is introduced in Hong Kong. And that is really a question. So like, well, whether Hong Kong could still gain the trust of like, well, Western countries and Western enterprises, that's one uh, key debate. And if we recall like, well, one of the survey like, well, released by the American uh, Chamber of Commerce in, in March in Hong Kong. Um, so according to the survey, like more than 40% of the respondents surveyed by, uh, uh, the American Chamber of Commerce are considered opting to leave Hong Kong, like 40% of them. And 62% uh, cited this com- comfort with the national security law as a reason. So, so I think the number is quite stunning and revealing in, in telling us like, well, whether folks like, well, in, in the business community still have trust uh, over the legal system and as economic uh, prosperity. And like in the past, like, well, the America Ch- American Chamber of Commerce, like, well, in the 80s and 1990s, it was one key organization really like, well, bringing into uh, the Western uh, uh, expertise, knowledge, technology into China in like, well, uh, go- going forward for like, well, different uh, uh, venture, like, well, projects in China. But like, if the members of the American Chamber of Commerce uh, is like we're having a new thought on like whether Hong Kong could would still be an ideal place for a business, I think it is really like sending out uh, an alarming signal in 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 warning that like well as like well whether Hong Kong could still preserve its economic freedom in, in the foreseeable future. So the like the answer could be like really gloomy, but like the officials would try to like well, preserve and and maintain and keep saying that like well one country two systems still remain and investment is welcomed. And uh, they would like, I'll keep Hong Kong as hope, open and free as possible. But whether that's true is another question. And I think that also ties with like, well, uh, the coming negotiation, the trade negotiation between like, well, uh, the US and China, like, well, whether like, well, the China would keep like reforming 
this financial system, like open its domestic market to like well foreign enterprises. I think that might also connect to like well, uh, like the economic function or the economic role of Hong Kong and 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 how much leverage uh, it could preserve. Uh, and I'll just add one point. I think um, Alex, I think, have said many of the things that I, I, I definitely agree with. Um, I, I, I don't profess to be, I'm not a historian, I'm not an economist. Uh, I, I am a, an organizer, activist, and, and, and uh, by trade. Um, but I, I think that what I see is that there's something unprecedented that's happening in Hong Kong right now because this is a city that was free. In many ways, ranked number one <laughs> in economic freedom for many, many years. So this is unlike some of the other places of what we see of the opening, right? From a, from a closed society, politically, economic, into an open capitalistic or and, and democratic. We're trying what the Chinese government is attempting is to reverse what has already been established and practiced freely and operated for many years. And, and, and I think that um, in some way, this um, might have fooled some of the corporations in the Western world into thinking that, oh, this is okay, this is okay, we still have freedom because they were still to operate and have some of the same flexibility and freedom that they enjoyed before. I think that this is a, a watershed moment. I think this is a pivotal point of people recognizing that they are in the pot and the water is, is, is boiling and heating up and have been for a while. Um, and if they continue to want to buy into the myth that economic freedom can be separate from political reform and freedom, then I think that uh, we are going to find ourselves again at the same spot where we did with the mainland China, where we keep thinking that trade is going to bring rights and freedom. We keep thinking that access to information like the internet is going to somehow free up uh, the rest of the institutions in the mainland. Um, what the Chinese government is banking on is our foolishness and naivete to believe that we can continue to have the illusion of economic freedom without the accompanying uh, political individual freedom that Hong Kong has enjoyed. And so I think that it, it's um, clear now, I think, uh, and it's a moment that uh, it's up to us to believe uh, the PRC government and the Hong Kong government is who they say they are. Uh, and, and I think that um, it is up to us to, to make it clear um, for corporation, for individuals, for, for, for Western uh, American companies to take a serious look at um, what are the costs of operating the status quo in the mainland and in Hong Kong. Thanks very much. I think you're right. And ultimately, this will be an empirical question. So we're all going to have to uh, watch and, and, and observe what happens. Uh, in, in many ways, Hong Kong was always an anomaly, uh, a country with a high level of of freedoms, um, civil and personal and, and certainly economic without having uh, political freedom. And no doubt that's because of the tradition of uh, the British rule of law and so on that is now uh, being tossed aside. Uh, for our part at the Cato Institute, we are going to continue to measure Hong Kong independently in our human freedom index precisely because we care about the, the level of, uh, of freedom there. And already we have seen a deterioration in its levels of freedom. Uh, and uh, no doubt uh, it's going to be showing up in our future indexes in, in a uh, continuous uh, fall as we uh, update it to the, the most recent years. Um, we're also from the Cato Institute gonna continue to be paying close attention to, to Hong Kong, to your activities. Uh, we're gonna continue as my colleagues uh, at Cato who follow uh, immigration rules have done advocating uh, to, for the United States to let the Hong Kongers come to America, uh, especially those who want to come here on a, on a refugee basis. I think that all liberal democracies uh, should be doing that. And that's certainly one way, as Doug mentioned, uh, that the United States can, can help. And we wish you 
Alex and Samuel luck in everything that you're doing. We, we know that we'll be in touch. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Doug. Uh, and thanks for the great work you're doing at the Hong Kong Democracy Council. Thank you. Thanks.